The Syntax of Things by Arisha. Chapter 42. To be a fool. Wands and cauldrons. Severus woke up to the assumption that he was losing his mind. After contemplating the possibility of arranging a visit to St. Mungo's to get himself admitted, he covered his face with his blanket and enclosed his thoughts into his execrable meditation. Absolutely certain that some kind of psychosis was beginning to take control of him, he felt relief. The idea that this had to be a medical problem and not yet another dark curse meant to end him was at the very least comforting. Psychosis, he thought. It explained a lot, undoubtedly. The tension he experienced when around Potter was one of the terrifying mysteries he had now finally solved. He shouldn't be surprised that he'd end up like Eileen someday. Deep down, he always knew he would. Unhinged, dysfunctional, detached, and absolutely not to be trusted. He just didn't think it would happen so soon. And to his unfortunate luck, his illness was now spreading to younger victims, too. Severus rubbed his temples with both hands. Perhaps it had nothing to do with Eileen, come to think of it. His mind ran through the rest of his family history fast, and after some time, he chose to blame his father's alcoholism instead, and why not his own, too, for the doom that life had thrown upon him. As he went through his morning routine, he felt torn between willingly agreeing to take whatever potions would numb this madness and letting the healers feed them to him. He recalled the events of last night with disbelief, eagerly confessing to a student that he was planning on assaulting another student, a 14-year-old one, then dismissing Potter and immediately locking the door behind him, waiting for the boy to leave so he could jerk off over intense sexual fantasies involving a little girl, a girl which he had never even noticed before. Embarrassment washed over him, and he made a silent promise to never be near children again. What was wrong with him? Unable to find a solution to his sorry situation, he dressed himself and prepared his mind for the torture that awaited him. He would have to talk to Dumbledore, however embarrassing it may be. He needed help. It was a good thing that he'd noticed the signs of insanity before it was too late. Severus waved his wand at the trash lying around the couch when he noticed the box of yesterday's chocolates thrown between two pillows. Sitting down, he took one between his fingers and sniffed at it cautiously. Of course! Potter was dead. Bursting into paranoid laughter, he tossed the box into the fire hearth and watched it burn just as he'd burned Potter's thick empty head once he saw him. Images of all the cruel and violent ways he would love to hurt the boy with flashed before his eyes and he nearly lost it. Potter wouldn't take the blame. He'd make excuses. He'd play innocent again. But who could blame St. Potter anyway? Everything Severus had attempted to teach him had simply gone to waste. All those lessons about the delicate art of protecting himself from mental attacks, about reaching a level where his mind's barriers could not be broken, so he could fall into a trap involving love potions! Potter was dead. He was stupid, immature, impossible, and dead. Severus would see to it personally, and Dark Lords be screwed. As he stormed through the corridors, it occurred to him that thinking of Gryffindor as the very temple of hypocrisy barely did justice to how vicious and evil those little devils could be. If a student of his own house had poured an illegal potion down another's throat, Severus would immediately have everyone's fingers pointed at him. And everyone's wants, too. The staff would give him the stare for a week, and Minerva would make sure to deliver a nice public speech on the school's morals and values. Screw Minerva, then. Her house was dangerous. When a Gryffindor went off wandering to the dark side, there was always compassion to be shown. It was either, oh, poor kid, or, but it was just a mistake, it's over now. For Slytherin, there were no excuses, ever. Slytherins were always seen as corrupted, manipulative, and malicious. For them, life was a constant struggle to prove themselves innocent. The fact that most of them had never done anything wrong in the first place was entirely irrelevant. Seeing a student dressed in Gryffindor robes coming down the stairs, Severus stopped. You. Find me, Romilda Vane. Tell her that she has 15 minutes to present herself at the headmaster's office and confess her crime against a student. She knows whom. He snarled at the curious look. The headmaster does not expect her, so inform her that should she lie about the reason of her visit, I will know and I will expel her myself. The student bailed and Severus was glad that he could still terrorize the students into doing what he ordered. He had authority. He still had authority. He clung to it desperately. Yes, sir! Utterly horrified, Severus kept striding through the stairs and corridors until he reached the door he was looking for. He slammed it open and was instantly aware of a crowd of stupid faces looking up at him.
Minerva looked at him with surprise, too. Scanning the glass quickly, Severus located the brat cowering over a desk in the far corner. May I borrow Mr. Potter for a moment? He asked and was aware of several yelps of shock coming from the back of the classroom. Yes, of course, said Minerva, giving him a look that communicated all the questions he'd have to answer later. Potter exited the class without looking at him. The door was slammed closed again, and Severus walked over to an empty classroom. He pointed in, and Potter complied obediently. Locking the door behind them and casting a soundproof spell, Severus grabbed Potter by the collar and pushed him against the wall with all his strength. Why must you cause me problems? He hissed. He clenched his fist to stop it from punching Potter's face. I, I didn't know. I swear I woke up and... You didn't know because you are short-sighted and utterly stupid. He shouted. What have I been teaching you the whole year, huh? Why am I wasting my time on you if you don't care to think? Is your brain completely damaged, Potter? Has the killing curse broken your skull? Driven by impulse, Severus dug his nails in Potter's throat. He wanted to strangle him. Tell me what would have happened if you gave me a chocolate before I took it on my own. Hasn't your sweet horrors taught you the instructions? I believe you know. Potter gaped, his enragement lost somewhere between wincing and blushing. Well, tell me, Potter. Potter looked down, then up to Severus. You would have fallen for me for a while because I'd have given the love potion to you. In other words, not a goddamn big deal. The point Severus was trying to make was slipping further away, and Potter didn't seem to catch the severity of it. I would have thrown myself at you, Severus said deranged. You, of course, would have responded with utter enthusiasm, potion or not. Am I wrong? Potter stared. Am I wrong? Severus yelled. Still no response. You would have, Severus said, his lips twisted with rage, and I would have to resign and leave my life as I know it in the past forever. Because of you. I didn't do it on purpose. Why do you have to blame me for everything and get your hands off me? Potter said hoarsely while pushing at Severus's wrist. Severus stepped away quickly and Potter rubbed his throat shakily. Miss Vane is already explaining herself to the headmaster, Severus informed him. I'm not blaming you for consuming the potion. I am blaming you for accepting the gift in the first place. Fame, you silly boy, comes with risk. Proud though you may be of it, if you're not careful enough, it might just as well kill you. You sent her to Dumbledore. Potter's disbelief wasn't exactly what he desired to see at the moment. Terror and regret would make a much better image. Tears of apology and pain for lack of thinking even better! Indeed, Potter. It seems that not all Gryffindors can break the rules and remain unpunished. So you're telling me that she went to Dumbledore and said that Professor Snape wanted her to be punished for slipping me a love potion? Precisely. But the potion was given to me. How are you going to justify that you knew? Severus stared. A dim aspect of his consciousness woke up from a deep, restless sleep and began to work furiously. How did he know what the girl did? How was he going to justify it? Indeed... Very well, then. He dug his own grave and was happily waiting to be thrown in. He'd been careless. He was startled by his own idiocy. Leaving Potter standing there, he marched off to Dumbledore's office only to find Romil Devane sobbing and wiping her eyes with a napkin. A long, cringeworthy lecture and a slap on the wrist later, Dumbledore dismissed her coldly and the two men were left alone. Dumbledore looked at him expressionlessly. He pointed at the chair, and Severus took the seat in what he chose to call his very own court of injustice. He didn't know how to begin. The anger behind the peaceful blue eyes was dreadfully clear, and Severus knew he deserved all of it. Moments passed, but Dumbledore didn't greet him, and didn't offer him the usual gentle smile. Instead, he toyed with his wand and studied Severus silently. And as much as Severus wanted to push back with the very same silence... He knew he was weak at heart when it came to patience, and he'd damn himself before he prolonged this hell any longer. Here it goes, then. Potter has been visiting my chambers nearly lightly since the term start. I'm teaching him how to occlude his mind. I hid it from you because you wouldn't approve. Occlumency, Dumbledore said unsurprised. Is he making progress? Yes. He's fighting back without a wand now. Still toying with his wand lazily, Dumbledore twisted it in his fingers and almost pointed it at Severus for a brief second. Severus froze, waiting for a curse. An unforgivable one, definitely. Dumbledore casually shifted his wand again between his fingers and Severus was left with the impression that he was being mocked. 
I am aware that he hasn't been sleeping, Dumbledore said calmly. His sleep has been problematic for a long time. I'm not at fault for it. Aren't you? Dumbledore smiled. The nature of your relationship is professional. Unlikely, but it wasn't a question. Absolutely. Hmm. What happened last night? Severus recounted the previous night's events, carefully leaving out his own arousal and whatever ungodly things he had talked about with the boy. All in all, his story had gaping holes screaming for attention, but Dumbledore didn't poke at them. He left before midnight. I didn't know I had been poisoned until today. It wasn't a Morchentia. It barely lasted for a little while. My bet is on some cheap knockoff from Zonko's and the like. As you imagine, I don't want to see the girl in my class ever again. Dumbledore clasped his hands on his desk. She only knows about Harry. Severus nodded. A minute passed in silence, and this time Severus failed to mind his tongue. Do you want me to keep him away? The fear that crept under his words was a sinful sign of being human, he told himself. Lily herself was willing to stay away from her own son, if that could save him. No, let me finish, Dumbledore said sternly as Severus tried to protest. Tell me, how can I allow you to bond with the boy when your job is to surrender to Voldemort and kiss his feet? It's a risk I cannot take. Severus wanted to explain, but Dumbledore raised up a finger. What is surprising, however, is that you don't want to keep away from him. Severus stared at the profound expression of words he could not honestly disagree with. He wished Potter was here so he could make this his fault somehow. Right now, Severus was exposed to a nasty trap from which there was no way out. If he wanted to survive it, he would merely have to play along. He did want to be near Potter. Denying it was an act in vain. It did not work. Everything he'd done to push Potter away had only brought him closer. I'm teaching him, he said stupidly. And he's making progress, Dumbledore reminded him. So from now on, I believe I could take care of it myself. No. Dumbledore raised an eyebrow at Severus's unsteady voice. I'd sooner die than hurt him. I've done nothing against him, nor have I taken advantage of him. He made sure to stress his last words, and he was momentarily distracted as Fox spread his wings and flew to the other side of the room. Dumbledore didn't flinch. I trust you, Severus, even if you believe I don't. I trust you with my life, and if you hurt him, it'll be unintentionally, I'm sure. You need to ask yourself, however, what would young Draco think if he accidentally saw Harry coming out of your rooms? What would any of your little snakes think? Enthusiastic as they are to prove themselves, especially now, I suppose they would relay the information to the wrong people at once. And I also suppose Voldemort would kill you for treachery. Handmaster, he started, give me a chance and I can do this right. He's being careful. I trust you repeated Dumbledore. Well, you don't trust me enough, snapped Severus. Dumbledore seemed lost in his thoughts for a moment, then... If it is so important to you, you may assist him once a week, Saturdays, let's say, never after midnight. Oh, and something else to read the new Witch Weekly tomorrow. Why? What is it? His stomach dropped. Harry made some interesting announcements this morning. It was... Ah! For the front cover, the boy who lived wants her cauldrons. Proud and impudent, Harry Potter could not bear to remain hidden in the closet after so many years of lies and secrecy. Yesterday morning, in the presence of his innocent and modest classmates, the boy who lived confessed between heartbreaking sobs that he was been suffering from the most contemptible sickness of the soul, homosexuality. Vincent Crabbe, one of Harry Potter's closest friends, admits that he had been suspecting it for a long time. With the question, Is our global star really gay? He responds, He never looked normal anyway, did he? Hermione Granger, his long-term girlfriend, refused to express her sorrow, although the pain of betrayal was easy to be seen in her red, swollen eyes. Severus cringed visibly at the paper and moment. Between heartbreaking sobs, he muttered as he gave it back to Minerva. Minerva smiled at him in a circumspect way only she knew how to master. She glanced at the Gryffindor table and then back to her steak. Potter was laughing about something with Granger. 
Do we know what actually happened? Severus asked. During breakfast, I believe he was discussing something of a personal nature with Hermione Granger. Another student heard them, asked if he'd heard right, and then the babble spread. She said curtly. Apparently, she did not approve of her students being the little snoopers that they were. Mr. Potter was slandered by the entire table, I'm told. He was left with no choice but to accept the rumors as true. Severus bit back a snort as he remembered his place in the world. At last, Potter was learning. I imagine how touched you must be by his bravery to stand up for himself, he said silkily. How many points exactly does his heroism earn him, I wonder? Points? She asked, her voice colored with her usual pretentious surprise, Severus knew too well. For what? Absolutely none, of course. He earned his points later in class. Ah, little windows for Potter to fly out of when all the doors were locked. This was what Severus loved. This talent of always winning without even wishing to do so. Potter had fallen into a cauldron of Felix Felicis long before he stepped foot in Hogwarts and was now enjoying his shiny fates. Severus made a mental note to investigate the unluckiness of people stuck with lucky little bastards. Potter didn't look at him as Severus observed his new joy at the weight having been lifted off his shoulders. A person without secrets always looked happier, healthier. A stabbing sensation warmed its way further into Severus as he watched the world around Potter still existing and going on, and Potter at long last moving along with it. The greatest secrets were always hidden in the most unlikely places. Severus wasn't the keeper of the dirty secret anymore. Potter's need for someone who understood had solved itself out. All was for the best. The gaping hole that had been ripped open in Severus's chest feared what this new twist might bring. The part of him that was ready for this, and had been warning him all along inwardly, celebrated his wish for peace finally being fulfilled. Clinging desperately to reason, Severus ignored his sudden anger, and settled down to be happy for the boy's decision to be again part of the world. He watched his plate in disbelief. Eating a mouthful of what tasted like ash, he settled to play along with whatever life brought him and forget the little oasis in the desert that had been forcefully shoved into his hands. Oasis? No, prison. He's a clever boy, Minerva stated, and Severus was startled that the conversation still going on. I wonder why you can't see it. But he could, and cleverness was what he feared the most in Potter. Cheek, desire to be himself in ways no decent human being would without permission. Gathering his things, he excused himself and set off to a quick pace as he strode towards his chambers. His living room was cold when he reached it, and he didn't bother lighting the hearth as no one would visit the night. Changing into his bedclothes, he locked his door and collapsed on the bed, contemplating about a particular bottle of scotch waiting for consumption back home. He supposed he should feel some gratitude that he'd at last sleep early. His thoughts trailed off to the other boy who needed his help. He pondered the due misery of being unable to occupy himself with anything but the adolescence from which he had graduated ages ago. His mark irked, and he rubbed his arm absently. If he'd been sober enough to hate himself for it, he would have acted properly when Potter attacked him last summer. He would have slammed the boy against the wall and beat him until he begged for forgiveness for his terrible deed. The blurry memory of that kiss didn't thoroughly satisfy him, though, and the parts he was missing were enough for him to not fully know how it had started. Not that it mattered, or that he was going to think about it now. Potter was free. Severus ought to sleep. And life went on.